Welcome everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today. We're happy you could be here. Uh, I wanna start with a few notes about today's lecture. The lecture today will be recorded. There's a possibility that you could appear in the recording um, because this is set up as a Zoom meeting. Um, so please turn off your camera if you don't wish to appear. We'll also mute everyone um, at, the, at the beginning of the lecture to minimize interruptions of our speaker. Throughout the webinar, we um, ask you to submit questions using the chat function located at the bottom of your screen. Um, at the end of the talk, you can also raise your hand in the participants window to ask Dr. Kiesling a question at the end of her talk. Um, and with that, I will um, hand the podium over to Lai Shi Wang, a professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Uh, thank you very much, Abby. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 2020 Russia Marker Lecture. Um, so we're very pleased to have uh, Professor Laura Kissling from MIT to speak at this year's Marker Lecture. Uh, but before uh, my introduction of uh, Laura, I would like to invite uh, our department chair, Professor Janice Rotter Robby, to say a few words about uh, Professor Russell Marker and the Marker Lecture. Uh, Janice, please. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to give you some background on this, on this lecture, which has become one of the most important events in our department. So, so Russell Earl Marker is the benefactor and namesake of this lecture. Some things that you should know about him is he's the son of Maryland. He, is, he was actually born in Western Maryland in 1980, 1902 in Hagerstown, Maryland. He actually was the son of a sharecropper and he came to the University of Maryland in fall 1919 against the wishes of his father who wanted him to, to help work and support the family, but with strong encouragement of his mother. And at Maryland, he studied chemistry as an undergraduate. He earned a degree in 1923, a BS degree. And even as an undergraduate, he already started to display uh, excellent skill in the laboratory. And so he was, he was really known to have good, good hands, as they say, in organic chemistry. And because of this, and because of his passion for organic chemistry, he stayed on at University of Maryland as a graduate student and continued to do organic chemistry research. In fact, Technically, he, he earned a master's degree in 1924, but in reality, he stayed at the university until about 1926, continuing to do his PhD work. In fact, he completed all of the research required for a PhD to the point of submitting his dissertation to the graduate school. And I would say in 1926, and as today, the University of Maryland Graduate School is a stickler for detail. <laughs> And it turns out he had not completed a physical chemistry requirement for his PhD. And because of that, his dissertation was not accepted. So he actually didn't earn a degree. And he is a very feisty and independent man, or was a feisty and independent man. And he declared that he had had enough PCHEM. He had no need for additional PCHEM for, to do what he needed to do. And so he actually left without a degree, from, left without a PhD. And that in those days would have been, I guess, among the first PhDs in the university. So armed with his MS degree, he actually went off to work for the Ethyl Gas Corporation. At that time, they actually tetramethyl, I guess it's tetra, tetraethyl lead was added to gasoline. And so this company, that was their thing, uh, creating this. And so while at Ethyl, he, uh, was working on the development of a standard gasoline. So he was doing hydrocarbon synthesis. And he actually is credited with creating the octane, octane rating system for gasoline, which is continued today. But it, it turns out that's not his most important <laughs> contribution to chemistry. So it turns out he's doing the synthesis at the Ethyl Gas Corporation in Yonk, I think it was in Yonkers, New York. And he was doing these uh, kind of so very selective synthesis already in, in the 19, you know, I guess the late 1920s. So this came to the attention of research scientists at the Rockefeller Institute. And at the Rockefeller Institute, they had a need for certain molecules, which they were not able to produce. So, they, so as a favor to some scientists at the Rockefeller Institute, he synthesized some materials for them. 
And he was so good at it that they actually recruited him to the Rockefeller and he kind of transitioned. Rockefeller does more biomedical research. So he transitioned to Rockefeller there. His primary role actually, because he had a master's degree was to do synthesis, synthesis work for the leading researchers, but they did allow him to work on some projects on the side. And he developed an interest in natural product chemistry. And he, again, feisty independentness is a feature of, of him. And he came to some disagreement with, with the folks at Rockefeller in particular, he wanted to synthesize and pursue a certain program of research. And others more senior to him felt that it couldn't be done. He felt it could. <laughs> and so he decided to leave and ended up going to Penn State to a place that would allow him to do what he wanted to do. So even with a master's degree, he had, at that time in the 1930s, it was possible to join a faculty. So he joined the Penn State chemistry faculty. He, he worked on uh, you know, synthesizing hormones. I, I, he's credited with doing the first practical synthesis of the progesterone, of progesterone via the marker dec degradation. And he really um, developed a beautiful uh, chemistry. Most of his chemistry involved extracting materials from natural products. And it turns out, I guess, the yam, the certain types of yams that were present in Mexico had more of these natural products that, that made the synthesis more, more rapid. And so he, he gradually ended up moving, you know, spending a lot of his time in Mexico. He, he ended up creating, he's credited with helping to create essentially the Mexican steroid home, hormone industry. And his research led um, to really uh, important things. Um, the kind of chemistry that he did led to the kind of the, the synthesis that has continued to be used to, to create, to, to, uh, to synthesize cortisone, which is an, an important anti-inflammatory drugs. And he's also credited being with the modern, the, the father of the modern birth control pill because the, the chemistry that he did is, was obviously uh, updated and revised, but it's kind of essentially was a precursor to what is used today. So, so he has, I would like to say that he's basically uh, one of our most famous alumni. And I would say of, our ma of all of our master's degree recipients, he's probably been the most impactful in chemistry. And so we're very proud of him. And for these reasons, and in the 1980s, he became an honorary doctorate of the university. And, he, and, and we were very pleased that he was endowed this, this particular uh, um, lectureship series. And considering the type of work that he did, I think it's, it's I think, uh, I, ca I couldn't really think of a more perfect marker uh, lecturer than Dr. Kiesling, but I will now turn the podium back over to uh, Dr. Wang to, to introduce our speaker today. Thank you so much, uh, Janice, for the very nice highlight of uh, Professor Marker and the Mark lecture. So now it's really a great honor to introduce uh, Professor Laura Kissing from MIT, a speaker for the 2020 uh, Russia Market Lecture. Um, Laura is currently uh, the Novartis Professor of Chemistry at MIT and also a member of the Broad Institute in Boston. Um, so Laura is, uh, uh, again, is an organic chemistry by training but her research really spans many important uh, uh, areas, ranging from uh, fundamental organic carbohydrate chemistry, glycobiology, enzymology, signal transduction, uh, you know, uh, and you know, um, what, whatever you can name it, uh, to stem cell research. So um, Laura attended a college at MIT where she did undergraduate research on natural product synthesis with uh, uh, Professor, I think at that time with Professor Bell Roche, right? Uh, and uh, so then she ended her PhD in organic chemistry with uh, Professor Stuart Schreiber uh, at Yale. And at that time, I think uh, uh, her research focused on total synthesis of natural products with anti-cancer antibiotic activities. Uh, Laura, I think uh, your original uh, research interest uh, aligns well with uh, Professor Marker's interest in uh, hormone, steroid hormone uh, uh, research. So it's perfect. <laughs> then uh, Roy uh, continued to, uh, to 
do her postdoc study at Caltech with uh, Peter uh, Devin um, on molecular recognition of designed molecules uh, with uh, DNA and DNA triplex. So I think that uh, uh, is really the start of your interest in biology. <laughs> Uh, so Laura uh, started uh, her independent career at Wisconsin, I think uh, for a number of years, and on recently moved back to MIT. Uh, her research uh, uh, focused, um, her re research has been at the interface of chemistry and biology, as you, many of, uh, of us know, and uh, centering on understanding of the functions of glycans in life process. Um, so she used whatever methods and tools available for uh, her study. When there's no uh, good tool <laughs> available, she will invent one. So this is very cool, you know. Um, for some, at, at the early stage of her uh, independent career, uh, she invented I think, a beautiful chemistry to control the polymerization of uh, glycan ligand. So that really opened an area for protein glycan interactions because the multi-brand interactions is a hallmark for protein carbohydrate interactions to strengthen the affinity, right? I, I still remember I read a paper this long time ago. Uh, the title is uh, uh, "Strengthening Numbers," right? Uh, uh, <laughs> you know that is really like a kind of uh, you know uh, inspiring for 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 people like us when I was a postdoc at that time. Um, and, uh, and another area I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, Laura, you know, uh, played a, a very important role and made a great contribution is the characterization of the biosynthesis the pathway of uh, sugars or carbohydrates, uh, particularly uh, for the microbacterial system. And that is the bacteria, uh, uh, you know, cause the tuberculosis, uh, the infection, okay. And that I think will be a number of uh, useful targets for drug design or drug discovery. Um, so Laura, you know, uh, Laura actually um, uh, is a strong promoter of uh, multidisciplinary research. Uh, she was the uh, founding editor in chief of ACE's Chemical Biology. Uh, I think started in 2005. Uh, so that's really profound promotes the research as the interface of chemistry and biology is really a flagship journal in the field. <clears throat> and Laura has a number of awards and honors you know, as if you read uh, her CV. Uh, so she's a member of the AAS, uh, is a fellow of the AAS, a fellow of ACS, a member of the National Academy of Science, and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Science. And also I should mention at the early stage, Laura was the recipient of the Genius Award from the MacArthur Foundation. So um, uh, today I think uh, she will talk about uh, the, um, let, me, let me see the title. I mean, Talk about the glycans as a host microbial in interface. Okay, without uh, uh, further ado, uh, I will give the podium to Laura. Laura oh, please. Thanks. Thank you so much for that really kind introduction. Um, I'm really honored to be the marker lecture. I love, I, I had followed Marker's work, um, like I read about the the his role in all these in, important uh, findings. And I love that he was such an iconoclast. That part I didn't appreciate. So um, that is very cool. So this is a, actually the uh, photograph of the earth and it's covered, I put a glycocalyx around it. And that just reminds me to tell you that uh, every cell that we have that we know about on our planet uh, wears a carbohydrate coat. And I'm gonna talk about the role of this coat in detection of uh, pathogens versus commensals. 
So I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more, but we're, we're really interested in how do we tell the difference between bacteria that we need to get rid of, i.e. pathogens, versus bacteria that we want to keep inside us because they do something good for us, i.e. our microbiome. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. And I'm gonna, that sounds very biological, but I'm gonna show you a lot about um, molecular recognition of sugars. So um, that's, that's the plan. So what I wanna do is um, talk to you about, again, how we distinguish between um, microbes that invade us uh, versus our commensals. And as you guys know, you know, there's a lot of pathogens to worry about. Um, I would say that uh, Laiji mentioned uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Before so SARS-CoV-2, Mycobacterium tuberculosis caused the most number of deaths um, by a single infectious agent worldwide. So it was our number one pathogen. Um, and Klebsiella pneumoniae is another really important pathogen. Um, it's one of the escape pathogens. That means that our current uh, drugs don't work very well against this pathogen. And so um, there are a number of, of microbes that we need to target and keep at bay. And things like Mycobacterium tuberculosis and Klebsiella pneumoniae are, are usually not um, that serious for people that have a normal immune system, but they tend to attack when our immune defenses are down. So we have strategies to contain them. And so thinking about those strategies, I think is really beneficial for thinking about how we might combat things in a more, um, by taking advantage of how nature does it. Um, on the other hand, as you guys probably know, um, there's been a lot of publicity around the fact that we all have a microbiome that we, um, that we carry on us and, uh, Continuously, there's been information emerging that highlights the role of that microbiome. This on the left is an illustration of the hallmarks of cancer. And what I've shown is an overlay of the bacteria um, that can influence these hallmarks of cancer. So can cancer cells, Hanahan and Weinberg have outlined what cancer cells, what are the qualities of cancer cells, right? Like they resist cell death, they deregulate cellular energetics, et cetera. And what this is, is an overlay of what we know about bacteria that can influence these hallmarks of cancer. And I highlighted that, for example, bifidobacteria, if you have those in your gut, help you um, destroy cancer via your immune system. So they have a beneficial effect on, let's say, um, immunotherapies. So that's um, what is emerging as a picture for how bacteria influence disease. But we really, these are really just um, sort of loose relationships. We don't understand um, the molecular basis. And we certainly don't understand how to recruit certain bacteria. And so what I had said here is that you can't just uh, take a model of bacterial compet competition and understand how we pull out our commensal bacteria. So what people tend to do is sequence them and many different sequences can be adequate for survival and breakdown of food or they monitor their metabolites. But those metabolites, while really critical for um, health and disease, don't tell us how we recruit certain uh, populations. And so that's really what I wanna talk about. So I wanna talk about it from the standpoint of uh, carbohydrates. And that's because we've been really interested in how the cell surface carbohydrates influence recognition. And um, we thought that that might play an important role in how we recruit or get rid of certain bacterial species. And I just highlight the importance of these kinds of protein carbohydrate interactions by pointing out that you all began with a protein carbohydrate interaction. So um, the a protein on the sperm recognizes a carbohydrate on the surface of the egg. 
And that's obviously a pretty important recognition event. It's species specific. Um, it's uh, sufficient affinity that we can get fertilization. And you already know that the carbohydrates um, report on identity. And you know that because um, you probably know your blood group. And so blood group B versus blood group A. Uh, this is a pretty subtle difference. And yet your immune system can tell the difference. So our bodies are finally honed to recognize these different kinds of carbohydrates. And you probably know also that on cancer cells um, and on viral cell surfaces, there are carbohydrates that are different from our endogenous carbohydrates. Um, and global H, for example, is a tumor antigen that people have been interested in pursuing. And I like this picture because it shows, um, this is a, a, a normal cell and its cancerous counterpart. And you can see that the, there's a direct change in glycosylation on the surface of these cells. And so that glycosylation difference really has a market effect on um, these, the cell. It's, it's a, both a readout of the cell state as well as potentially um, an influencer of cell interactions. So we like to think about the carbohydrates on the surface of cells as the kind of base of the cell. It's a, a kind of ID for the cell. And what you can see here is a, a mouse endothelium and up here are the carbohydrates protruding from the surface of the cell. And this is um, a uh, lymphocyte. And here you can see also this thick layer of carbohydrate, which is stained. Um, so this is where a lot of the N-glycans that Lige's lab uh, studies would reside. And bacteria are the same, not surprisingly. So this is an evolutionarily conserved feature of every cell. And so, as I said, we like to think of these um, carbohydrates as kind of the face of the cell. And so if you're another cell and you need to tell the difference between these two, um, maybe carbohydrate recognition is what you do. And so, um, again, you know, this is, we use uh, appearance to tell the difference between Elvis and Beyonce and cells use their carbohydrate codes. So I already um, mentioned that, that sugars encode identity, right? They encode what type of cell, like who it's from or um, whether it's cancerous or not. And we build the carbohydrates that we have in us from a, about 32 building blocks. Um, bacteria use a, a different sort of language. They use all the building blocks that we use, but they add in some, uh, some of their own flourish. And so you can see here, this is a building block that we never use. Um, this is a building block. This is actually the furanose form of galactose. We never use that, but um, again, like these human pathogens put it on their cell surface. So they use uh, the six membered ring furanose form of galactose as well as the furanose. And then they put in, the bacteria put interesting appendages on their surface, they can be um, sulfated. This is a phosphoglycerol moiety. So there are a number of different uh, functionality. So bacteria use over 600 uh, different monosaccharides. And we started wondering whether there were, whether we could uh, define agents that would recognize certain uh, members of these classes. In other words, are there human proteins in us that selectively recognize bacteria and detect them? And so if you think about that, you can just ask if, if, the, if the carbohydrate coat is the face of the cell, how do we ID cells? And we use proteins to do that. Let me just say that there's a lot of different uh, carbohydrates that one could study. And we've, in our lab, are very interested in studying the ones that are recognized selectively. Because to me, those are the ones that are really uh, functionally important. And so 
Um, on our immune cells, we have so many carbohydrate binding proteins or lectins. So lectins are just carbohydrate binding proteins that are not, um, not antibodies. That's the definition. And we have all of these different lectins on our immune cells. These are membrane bound lectins that are involved in uptake of uh, pathogens through recognition of their sugars. We also have a number of circulating lectins inside of us. And I've listed some of these here. There's about 50 listed here, but I believe that's a, that's, um, a lower limit. And you can see how high a concentration of some of these there are uh, on the order of 25 micrograms per mil. So it turns out that we don't know that much about what these recognize. And I'll, I'll come back to that. But these are really interesting because we thought they could be cell analysis probes um, because they're soluble and in analyzing what they have evolved to bind that would teach us about how, again, we choose which cells live in us. And I'll just point out that many of these lectins are just of unknown specificity. Um, now, I've been talking about these proteins that recognize carbohydrates, and I wanna just show you what they look like. So, um, this is a typical uh, carbohydrate recognition protein. It's a trimer. You can see um, these three uh, alpha helices here um, come together here to, to form um, this trimer here. And there's three carbohydrate binding sites near these red calcium ions. And what they tend to have, <clears throat> so many of them have these very long collagen-like domains. So they can actually interact with each other once they bind to the surface of cells. And then they have N-terminal domains. This one in particular has an N-terminal domain that causes clustering. But some of them have N-terminal domains that recruit other arms of the immune system. Um, I'm going to use this SPD as an example because it's one of the proteins that we've studied. And as I said, it has this N-terminal domain that can uh, form, engage in protein-protein interactions to form um, the fuzzy ball multimer. And what these multimers do is they present their carbohydrate recognition parts out here. And so they cause bacterial cells to stick together. And when we find large clumps of cells like this inside our body, we tend to take up those cells, recognize them as bacteria, and um, kill them. So we take them up by cells that can destroy them. And this protein actually is in your lung. It's, it's um, implicated in a lot of different diseases, including um, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is what um, many COVID patients have. And so we've been interested in this protein it is known to agglutinate bacteria such as K. pneumoniae. Um, and that it had been, um, there were some studies of this and recently we um, got some clinical samples. So these are samples from uh, individuals that actually needed therapy. So hospital acquired um, K. pneumonia infections. And you can see that in the absence of lectin, right, the cells are not sticking together, but in the presence, um, they actually are, uh, they form these very large clumps. And so um, I'm gonna talk about this kind of data in a little bit more uh, detail later, but this is, this is an experiment to look at how much SPD binding um, to um, a microbiome one can see. So in this experiment, we took uh, human feces, they're frozen, um, and then we just isolate the bacterial cells from them. It's pretty straightforward. 
And then what this experiment is, is a flow cytometry experiment. So in this direction, what you're looking at is just identification of the bacteria. And the bacteria move in this way, um, depending on, they scatter light. So basically this is an instrument where the bacteria are passing individually. Every one of these little dots is an individual bacteria. They're passing through this instrument. The instrument shines a laser on it. And then we've fluorescently labeled SPD. And so if the bacteria bind to SPD, they shift up in this quadrant. And we didn't see a lot of bacterial binding to SPD. SPD is a calcium dependent lectin, as I showed you those big or, uh, red balls were the calcium ions. So we add EDTA and show that this is a specific interaction, right? We can compete off even this little binding that we see here in the presence of EDTA. But what that tells us is SPD doesn't bind um, to that many components of this microbiome. And if you look at where it is, now this is a mouse um, gut that I have an amazing uh, postdoc who learned to do this immunofluorescence. So SPD is shown in red, and these are the microvilli that stick up. I already showed you a picture of this. This is kind of the tissue down here and the gut cells. Remember that beginning where I showed you those endothelial cells? This is kind of um, uh, similar orientation. And you can see, um, you know, a marker, DAPI is a nuclear stain, but you can see that SPD is right below um, the tissues and so, or right below this uh, site. And so as if cells start to invade, um, bacteria start to invade the tissues, SPD is right there, ready to catch it. And so that lectin looks like it really functions in defense. And I'm gonna tell you about another lectin that we started studying, and you'll see how these two studies come together. This lectin is called um, human intellectin one or omentin. And it, so SPD is, is located down here. It's like down here, ready to catch uh, bacteria that start to come into the tissues. This lectin is over here. It's, a, it's at a site that um, is between your tissue and your microbiome. So um, I will actually, I can show you this picture that's even cooler. So this is actually a picture, not of our work uh, by Laura Hooper. This is um, a mouse uh, small intestine. And you can see this is the microbiome here and this is the tissue. And so you might not realize this, but you separate your microbiome from your tissues. And that's good. You probably don't want a lot of you know microbes just freely wandering throughout your body. And so the way that you do this is through a series of proteins. We, that includes um, antimicrobial peptides that kill microbes that start to go into the space. Mucus, uh, one of the coolest substances and very underappreciated. Um, enzymes like lysozyme that cleave the bacterial cell wall and then lectins. Of all these proteins, we thought that lectins might have a specificity for the microbes. And so that's why we decided to study this. And one of the lectins that's here is omentin or human intellectin one. And this is a lectin that's uh, implicated in a lot of inflammatory conditions like diabetes and insulin signaling. It's upregulated in gastrointestinal cancers, especially. And then um, genome-wide association data links this, links um, single uh, variants, so changes, single changes of amino acids in this lectin to Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and asthma. So this seemed like a cool protein to study. So I'm going to tell you, um, and it, it seemed like it would be potentially like SPD and involved in defense. And one of the goals we had was to identify um, lectins that might be involved in defense so that we could think about how to use them as antimicrobial agents, things that we wouldn't, um, we, that we wouldn't have uh, rapid resistance to, or the microbes wouldn't have rapid resistance. 
So when we started studying this, intellectins are conserved in many chordates. Um, so all the way from like sea sponges to uh, us. I mean, I don't think it's hard to be as awesome as this homo sapien, but um, so throughout the animal kingdom. And we could use intellectins to stain um, resident bacteria. So again, this is um, a mouse gut and you can see um, human intellectin one staining and that staining is calcium dependent. And here's the um, awesome Amanda Dugan who did this work. Uh, so I'm gonna come, come back to this, but we also saw some staining on the mucus. This is kind of neat though. You can see that it's produced um, by those cells that I, uh, that uh, were on my slides that are at the bottom of these microvilli that stick out. So we can see really nice staining of the lectin. It's secreted here and then it ends up here. Okay, so this is the same experiment that I showed you previously with SPD. Um, and now we have human intellectin uh, binding. So again, we have fluorescent lectin here. So any cells that are up here are bound by the protein. And here we have a stain that detects all bacterial cells and their migration in this way kind of in, is influenced by their size. And so what we see is um, quite a lot of binding to human intellectin to this um, fecal sample. And that binding again is calcium dependent. So we see uh, much more binding. This lectin really recognizes a large percentage of the microbiome. But what does it recognize? And that's what we wanted to know. I mean, this, I, I kind of complained early on that some of the studies of microbiome, um, of the microbiome were just, um, kind of listing of different types of species. And so how can we really learn some information? Well, we wanted to dig down to the chemical level. And so this is, so we used um, a glycan array and there are many different glycan arrays that are available. I'm gonna, and these arrays just have, right, individual spots that display different sugars. The one I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use two of them. One displays a lot of human sugars that are involved in the immune system. And the other one is a microbial array that displays a lot of sugars that are involved um, in pathogen recognition. So um, the people doing this project were Amanda, Christine, uh, and then pioneered by uh, Daryl and Pong. And so what we did is we took human intellectin and we asked what sugars does it bind to that are from mammals? And what we, the answer we got was none that we could detect. And then we asked what sugars does it bind that are found in microbes? And we saw just a ton of binding to different microbial sugars. And so then we asked, well, what are these sugars? And so we took the top 15 hits. And what we saw is that four of the top 15 were galactofurinose containing. Um, the top five hits all had uh, phosphoglycerol in them. And the rest of the hits had uh, KDO or KO. Um, so those are these. Uh, these sugars that have uh, carboxylates, they're related to the sialic acid sugars. So we saw um, very different kinds of carbohydrates and this initially worried us. If you think about um, what a lectin should recognize, it was kind of weird that it would recognize such different things. And so I wasn't sure that the data were real. And so we were able to solve the structure. And this is, a uh, um, a trimer similar to SPD, although with a very different fold. This is actually a new fold. And down here, there is kind of a known uh, fibrinogen-like domain. That's a domain that can engage in protein-protein interactions. And up here, 
um, are, is the carbohydrate binding. And we were able to diffuse in um, galactofurinose. And so there aren't structures of furanose sugars bound to lectins. So I was so excited to get this structure. And then when I looked at it, what you can see is the furanose is not really bound at all. It's just sticking out into solution. And what's bound is this little diol. So this little diol is interacting with a calcium ion in the binding site. And what you could see is that you need to have um, a CH2 group here because you have a tyrosine right here. So you couldn't use a diol that was on the ring because it would be sterically occluded. And so we had this little kind of aromatic box of a tryptophan over here and a tyrosine over here that allowed us to recognize just this little portion of the sugar. And so um, that little portion is in all of the hits that we had on the array. So that felt so good, like, okay, we totally understand this. Um, and this is a kind of neat thing because obviously there's no proteins that contain terminal 1,2 diols of this type. That's not an amino acid. And it turns out there's one mammalian sugar um, sialic acid that has this kind of diol, but the protein has evolved against binding that. And so we just wondered how, how general is this idea of this one, two diol? And so we thought we understood this because, you know, here's a diol KO and KDO, and then here's another diol heptose. And I'm showing LD heptose because it's more common, but DD heptose would have the same stereochemistry and we tested both of these. And this was a work we did with Paul Kozma's lab. And what we saw when we tested this um, was that, you know, um, we're, we're doing a competition experiment here that um, galactofurinose could compete off the lectin, KDO could compete off the lectin, KO could compete off the lectin, glycerol 1-phosphate could, um, but uh, LD heptose was terrible. It was 60-fold worse than the other diols, and DD heptose was not much better. And so um, this told us, kind of as you would expect, a 1-2 diol is not enough. This was actually kind of a cool result though, because LD heptose is found in so many, so many microbial sugars that if we bound to LD heptose, I'd be worried that this lectin would have no specificity at all. So it seems to have evolved against binding things that would just completely remove all specificity. So now I wanna just take a little break and um, talk to you guys about protein carbohydrate interactions. So um, I'm showing you like a 1,2 diol is good enough to bind to this protein. And so how do proteins actually recognize carbohydrates? So we had been fascinated by this question for a long time. So one way that you might think that they do this well is to use bifurcated hydrogen bonds, like using aspartate or glutamate residues where you form this uh, interaction and then you release water. So this is a stronger interaction because you have an anion and you release water and tropically favorable. So that should work. Um, another theme that you've already seen is a lot of these carbohydrate binding proteins have calcium in them. And the way that they interact is they have a lot of um, residues on the protein that hold the calcium there. And then they have um, the protein makes the diols of a carbohydrate a better ligand for the calcium. So the carbohydrate then interacts and chelates to the calcium. You could also imagine this being favorably favorable because you're gonna release water into solution. And so then the other thing that uh, people had proposed to be really important are aromatic interactions. And what they proposed is that these interactions were good because carbohydrates like glucose um, are polar around the ring where they have all these hydroxyls, but here up above and below the ring, they have CH bonds and that these um, non-polar CH bonds would interact with these sorts of aromatic bases, and this would be a kind of hydrophobic interaction. So we wanted to ask, 
is any of this true? And so we teamed up with Deck Wolfson's lab and they did um, a bioinformatic analysis of what residues are within five angstroms of a carbohydrate. And so when we look at what residues are in the PDB, so we looked at all the structures and we asked which residues are within, uh, I think we used uh, five angstroms of a carbohydrate, of the center of the carbohydrate. And what you would have thought from that earlier analysis is we would have a lot of um, aspartate and glutamate, and we have some enhancement. So this is um, propensity um, relative to all of the amino acids in the database. Okay, so we uh, normalize this these data to all of the amino acids present. So we see a little enhancement of aspartate and um, asparagine. We see actually a decrease in not non-polar hydrophobic in amino acids, and we see an increase in aromatics, um, especially electron-rich aromatics like tyrosine and tryptophan. And that is so reminiscent of uh, cation pi interactions. Um, and you can see uh, that this is, this is the, um, so you, you guys probably know, right? Like Dennis Darzi's lab has done beautiful work showing that cations like lithium, sodium, potassium like to sit over electron rich aromatics. Also ammonium groups love that. And so a tryptophan is an especially good uh, participant in cation pi interactions. Well, if you look at the position of electron rich aromatic rings in our system, what we saw is that only certain sugars really like to engage in these interactions, but all of the tryptophan residues, if I go back again, oops, let me go back. All of the tryptophan or electron rich aromatics with the exception of these two are all on one face. And this is beta galactose shown here. And so we uh, have studied the basis of this. And if you're interested, um, there's a 2015 uh, paper with Wolfson and Kiesling that talks about this. But what you can see um, here is that the electropositive CH bonds are the ones that stack over the aromatic ring. And by electropositive, I mean that CH3 interacts with the CO sigma star of this axial hydroxyl. CH5 interacts with the CO sigma star as well. And then CH4 interacts with the CO sigma star of this ring oxygen. So all of these groups are more electropositive than standard um, CH bonds in the system, like this CH bond, not electropositive at all. And we really don't see aromatics up there. We see them all down here. And so, um, so what about the difference between KO and LD heptose? Why do we have selectivity for recognition of KO versus LD heptose? That is a similar stereoelectronic effect. So LD heptose prefers a conformation like this. So this side chain rotates so that this CH bond can donate into this CO sigma star. Whereas um, this situation where we have this CH bond donating into the CO sigma star here is what we see in KO. So the side chain orients in the other direction because this electronic interaction allows this to adopt different conformations. So LD heptose doesn't bind to the protein, but KO can. And we actually looked in the database and we could, we could analyze that most of the structures in the database of KO that are bound to proteins show this um, conformation, whereas all of the structures of LD heptose bound to proteins showed this conformation. So these Stereoelectronic effects are really critical for dictating not just um, 
for dictating both carbohydrate confirmation and recognition. And these side chains might look like they're freely rotating, but indeed they are not. Or they're freely rotating, but they have favored conformations. And I'll just point out that we could dock. Um, so this is a structure of KO in black bound to the receptor. And you can see, even though there's a carboxylate in this structure, the diol is what binds to the calcium. And you can see that we could not overlay heptose. Heptose um, experiences stereo, steric interactions. So this indicates that stereoelectronic effects um, really dictate this recognition. Okay, so I'm now going to come back. We know what the carbohydrate binding protein recognizes. So is that recognition important for cell binding? And so we did this experiment. We did an experiment where we have um, serotypes here, 8, 20, 70, and 43. So this is... Um, this is a bacterium. So we're looking at um, uh, strep pneumoniae, so the causative agent of strep. And what we have here is a serotype 8 that actually is an important um, pathogenic variant of strep that doesn't have galactofurinose on it. So this uh, variant shouldn't be recognized. Um, then we have a variant that has galactofurinose on it, one that has uh, another version of galactofurinose, and then uh, 43 has a different, uh, has phosphoglycerol. So these are all the same species. They just vary in what carbohydrates they put on their surface. And what we could see is that we can recognize serotype 20, 43 and 70. So these are flow data, just like I've shown you, but now I've changed this into a histogram. So this is the total population of cells that you're looking at. So a shift to the right means binding of the lectin. And you can see that if we add um, serotype eight here, that looks just like a control protein. So serotype eight doesn't shift to the right. It's not binding this lectin at all. So we can see very specific recognition, which presumably occurs via this multivalent binding. So um, what I want to do now is talk about what we know about what this lectin does. So, and by that, I'm going to tell you, this is still a story um, in flux. So I've told you a lot about this one protein and you might wonder, okay, Laura, that's so cool. It recognizes bacteria, microbes, or maybe you don't even care about that, but like we care. And so the question is, what does it do? And so we thought it was going to be a cytotoxic agent. Actually, the experiment I just showed you, I was a little sad because it didn't recognize the most virulent form of strep pneumonia, it kind of recognized forms that we're good at combating on our own. Um, and so, but we thought maybe it would be anyway a cytotoxic agent and we just hadn't found the right bug. So um, this protein REG3 is really critical for preserving the barrier that I already showed you. And when you have a deletion of this a REG3, you get inflammation of the tissues. The bacteria just start to invade um, because this protein is killing them because as they go through here. And again, this is work of Laura Hooper's. And then Sean Stowell and Rick Cummings showed that another protein, Galactin 8, that's also found in your gut, could kill E. coli. Um, but both of these require pretty high concentrations, but they suggest that they're cytotoxic. So we tested our protein, we added tons of it, and we couldn't detect any cytotoxicity. Um, so 
everything I've been showing you is, um, again, looking at cells with flow cytometry. I think I should have moved this up earlier, but what we're doing is, again, running these cells through the laser and detecting them. So what I'm going to start to show you are some data where we um, detect binding through this, through this mechanism. Um, and again, you know, you, you can look at uh, multiple proteins that are fluorophore labeled. Um, so this is kind of cool. You can get multi-dimensional plots and then we turn this into histograms. Okay, so we started asking, you know, what kind of microbes that live in us would this protein bind? And um, so what, what this work we did um, with Federico Ray's lab, he had about 70 strains of gut bacteria bacteria that live in us. And we took these strains individually and we asked, which does human intellect and bind to? And so this is an example where we could show that um, in blue is when we add the lectin and you can see the shift to the right shows that this lectin binds lactobacillus ruteri. It binds um, Escherichiae fergusoni. It binds uh, Bacteroides plebeus. This is kind of a cool one. This is a bacteria that you have a lot of and you if you eat a lot of sushi. Um, it binds uh, bifidobacteria. Remember I told you that if you have a lot of bifidobacteria in you, you have a better response to immunotherapies. This um, is one of the quote unquote uh, bacteria that has many beneficial functions. It's also the bacteria that are in babies. So right when you're you're born, you have a lot of bifidobacteria in you. And so it's thought to be um, a a good agent to have in you. Lactobacillus ruteri is also another bacteria that's in a lot of um, in a lot of probiotics. So what was weird about this lectin is it didn't seem to be binding the super pathogens. Instead, it seemed to be binding a bacteria that seemed like you would want to have in you. And so we did this experiment. We took um, some kefir from the grocery store and we just isolated the bacteria from it. And then we looked at um, human intellect and binding. And what you can see in red is that it binds about 80% of the um, of the cells that are in this kefir. So it's binding probiotic bacteria. So we wanted to ask um, from this experiment, um, if we had like a standard community, would the lectin show selectivity for binding members of the community? And if so, what bacteria would it bind? Um, and so we decided to look at whether or not differences um, that you can see in specific carbohydrate interactions would then lead to differences in the bacteria that we bound in a community. And so we took again SPD, which is known to bind the heptoses, interestingly, right? And this is a very broad recognition motif, whereas human intellectin can bind a variety of, of um, sugars, but has these sugars appear in fewer species. And so we were interested in whether we could use these tools to distinguish between bacteria. So here's how we did this experiment. We took our microbial community, and again, this is a fecal sample from a human, and then we add our fluorescent lectins, and using the um, analyzer, we can either analyze, like, does the population change between, for example, health and disease? Um, does the population change depending on what lectin I use? or we could actually sort the cells. So what you can do here is sort populations that are binders or non-binders and then figure out what they are um, by sequencing. So I'm gonna show you this. So we, um, we call this strategy lectin seek. It's a kind of new way for looking at cell populations. And so I'll just show you what we found. So up here are three different lectins, human intellectin, mannose binding lectin, which is another lectin involved in um, host defense, and SPD. So I've been telling you mostly about the first and the last one. 
And you can see that um, just by scatter of the cells and uh, that they're binding different populations. Right. If we just think of this kind of like an NMR without fully analyzing everything, you can see there's kind of different intensities in different populations. All of these lectins are calcium dependent. So we add EDTA and we show that the signals that we're seeing here are due to specific recognition. <laughs> so then we um, decided to develop this uh, new way of identifying what bacteria are we looking at? And this is kind of complicated because we have a lot of different populations and we don't have a huge amount of sample. And so, but what we do is we sort pro-binders and anti-binders or binders and non-binders. And then um, we take in lysis cells and we get their genomic DNA. And then we add little barcodes to the DNA so we can identify uh, which sample it's from. And then we um, use PCR and then we analyze by sequencing. And so I'll just show you some of the data. Um, this was really, what you can see already is that we see really differences for human intellect in binding and SPD binding. So in this red is um, depleted um, for different bacterial species, green is enriched. Um, so those are more prevalent binders of human intellectin. Those were enriched by adding intellectin. Depleted means, right, we didn't, what, after we added intellectin, we didn't, we didn't see any of those in the population. And then no change where presumably we're just carrying along bacteria. So what you see is human intellectin and SPD are very complementary in what they recognize. And that right away suggests that they have different roles. Um, and then we looked at what these bacteria are. So SPD is recognizing Pseudomonas aeruginosa. That's another one of those escape pathogens that's actually a really important human pathogen. Very cool that we have our own lectin that's presumably in your lung and in your gut down um, regulating infections of these guys. Um, also, this is another, um, this uh, multophilia is another antibiotic resistant human pathogen. Whereas over here, the bacteria that we found are like Bacteroides plevius, that's the one in sushi. Um, these bifidobacteria that I already mentioned that show these uh, beneficial effects. So this was actually really cool. We were recognizing con commensals with this guy and pathogens with the other guy. Um, and I'll just point out that, um, that a lot of the species decreased in um, Crohn's disease um, were species that we can bind, suggesting that people who lose some of these bifidobacteria and other uh, bacteria are more susceptible to disease. So one thing we wanted to ask is, can we actually use this method? And this is all unpublished. So I want to just show you some of our uh, work that we're really excited about. We want to ask, can we use this method to actually tell the difference um, between patients? And so this was a healthy, this is a healthy donor. And you can see binding um, of human intellectin and it's calcium dependent. And then this is SPD binding to this healthy donor. Um, and then we looked at um, human intellectin binding to um, an IBD patient. And what we see is much few, many fewer bacteria in this um, IBD patient bound this lectin. Whereas we saw actually an increase in binding to uh, SPD um, and we, count this as an increase because we believe these are very large clumps of cells. So there's probably more cells here than it appears represented. So we can detect these differences in um, carbohydrate recognition. They're manifested at the level of species and then they're manifested at the level of controlling or potentially um, influencing which species are there. So I want to just end 
hopefully I'm not too long and a little long and quickly. I want to just end by telling you how we think this might work. And so I, I showed you that human intellect in binds here, we could detect it on the mucus. Um, and so we thought maybe it might bind to bind um, mucus. And so I'm just going to show you some data. We looked at some mucus. Um, these are mucin proteins, so highly O-glycosylated proteins that are found in the gut. And what we showed is that um, we see a lot of binding of human intellectin to these um, proteins that are part of the gut mucus. And um, that binding is not calcium dependent. So remember there's another side of human intellectin, and I mentioned that that um, side has a protein-protein interaction domain. We think that that domain may be interacting with the, the um, proteins uh, that comprise the mucus. So what would that mean? That, that means that maybe the job of this protein isn't um, to kill microbes that we don't want, but rather to recruit microbes that we do want. And so if it binds to the mucus surface like this through the protein-protein interaction domain, it has all of its carbohydrate binding ca capacity oriented toward the microbes. And so we think it may be recruiting the good guys. And that's exciting because that's a role for these uh, lectins that hadn't been defined. And so we think you know, you can't just deal with defense, you also need an offense. And so we think uh, lectins like SPD are really important for getting rid of pathogens, but then intellectin, which by the way, in children, um, in babies when they're first born is at its highest level, might be involved in recruiting the microbes that we need into our bodies. And so I think that's a really um, exciting possibility and suggests new strategies for modulating uh, disease. And so, um, yeah, so you could be a probiotic or an antibiotic and both are needed. Um, so we think that this general strategy of lectin seek and using lectins to distinguish between cells could be really useful um, for other diseases as well. And we're interested in pursuing that, um, especially with regard to our friends at the Broad who are developing this human cell atlas. So um, I am so lucky to work with just an amazing group of people um, shown on this slide. Um, Mike was responsible for the SPD work. Christine is really the pioneer of the lectin seek studies I mentioned. Um, I think Amanda is hiding somewhere. There's Amanda who's been uh, critical for this uh, project as well. But all of these people um, in, interact and, and make important contributions. I have some great collaborators. Um, I mentioned um, hopefully Romnick Xavier, uh, Rick, Rick Cummings, Jim Paulson, um, and also uh, Barbara Imperiali um, for this project and Katerina Ribic. So um, I've been really fortunate and I wanna thank you guys again for your attention. Sorry if that ran a little long. Thank you so much, uh, Laura, for a very stimulating lecture. You have shown us uh, like, uh, <laughs> You know, all the, those interesting biological problems can be reduced to chemistry, basically. That is the, at the, the molecular level interactions, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I was really amazed by the uh, human interacting story. So you, you, you have shown us how the, you know, the steric electronic effects can dictate the, uh, you know, the specificity uh, an affinity of the lactin uh, interaction with the carbohydrate moieties on bacteria and human cell surface. Yeah. So uh, of course I have more questions on that side, but uh, you know I I, I think uh, you know uh, you will be happy to receive some questions from the audience. Yeah, I think we we, we do have a, a few minutes for that. So for those who have questions. Uh, 
please uh, raise your hands or you can go to the chat to write down your problems. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, it, it's uh, fascinating that you have the system for distinguishing pathogens and commensal bugs. It seems like one should worry about a pathogen that learns to put the commensal uh, glycans on its surface. That could be really bad. Uh, is there is there a, is that prevented somehow? Yeah. So that's a really good question. I think um, so. First. First, I will say for sure pathogens decorate themselves with carbohydrates to, dis to disguise themselves. So they will actually decorate themselves sometimes with, our, with carbohydrates that look like ours. So they'll put like, there are, so certain ones will put like heparin or chondroitin. They'll make things that make us think that they're us. Um, and so I suspect what you said occurs, but since we just kind of found this out, we haven't really um, been able to, you know, look at that yet. But I think that that's a really interesting question. Some of these lectins, I believe, will work in concert. And so it might be a combinatorial language also that's really critical. So I don't want to just imply like SPD only recognizes pathogens and intellectin only recognizes um, quote unquote, you know, bacteria that we would like to keep inside of us. But we have retained these over the years as have other, um, right, other animals. And so I think that, that they, that we do need a positive selection for these microbes and so I think that that may be a critical role that's been um, largely neglected. Uh, Phil, you have a question? Yes, uh, thanks, Laura. I was interested in this stereo electronic effect. Uh, so th this would appear to be uh, a, a significant effect and actually pretty powerful. So can you guesstimate what, you how much you're seeing in terms of like kilocalories and binding, how strong does the binding become because of that over, let's say a background where you don't have that stereoelectronic effect and also the barrier to rotation. If you have yeah, rotation. okay. So the so let me just go back to the CH, I'm gonna go back to the CH pi interactions, which are um, right, the, the electronic effects that I talked about. So I, I kind of went through that a little bit um, rapidly, but the, all of the uh, sugars that engage in this are like beta mannose, beta galactose. Those are the ones that have the most beneficial, you know, there could still be a, there's a, definitely a hydrophobic component, but we used a Hammett plot to show that there's actually, um, there's actually a, a strong electronic component. So more electron rich rings are better at doing the CH pies than less electron withdrawing rings. Like if you put a nitro group on a tryptophan, you can completely abrogate the effect. Um, but then we measured, so this is also unpublished. We've made some mutants of uh, a particular uh, lectin, a, a galactin that has a CH pi interaction. And we can show that using calorimetry, that interaction is worth in that system, uh, uh, four kcals per mole. And there's three CH bonds. So it might be worth 4.2. So I'm gonna say it's about 1.4 kcals per um, CH pi interaction, which is pretty significant, especially when these interactions are so intrinsically weak. Right. Yeah, four over zero effectively then becomes a significant number. Yeah, yes. So it's actually, I, I think, and, and that's why I think that the stereoelectronic effects are so important, right? Because you're, you're really at the margin of binding. Like most of these interactions are kind of millimolar. And so you really need those interactions to get you know, you need the alignment to get any little extra binding interactions you can. 
And one of the things I also skipped over that your question raises is um, I think that a lot of these are synergistic. Like if you think about the calcium binding, calcium binding is gonna facilitate also CH pi interactions because you've organized the system and you're kind of pulling on it, right? You have a Lewis acid that's pulling on it a little bit more. So maybe you polarize those bonds just a little bit more. Okay. Yeah, perfectly reasonable. Reasonable, but I think underappreciated by at least the, I, it's not a hydrophobic effect. Yeah. And I think it can work in other systems. The other reason that I, I talk about it is because, you know, this CH pi interaction that we saw with intellectin, that's a side chain interaction, right? So it's not even really a carbohydrate. We still saw a CH pi off of that side chain. That suggests other people can take advantage of that in designing, you know, inhibitors or ligands. So Laura, just to follow uh, uh, that question, uh, as you know, in the field, I think we talked about this before, like, uh, you, know, you know, a lot of people believe uh, the hydrophobic interaction, you know, plays like an important role for the CH and the pi interaction, but that is basically based on your studies, it seems like uh, the cation pi interaction actually, you know, dominate instead of the hydrophobic interactions. Yeah, it, I think that there can be a hydrophobic component, but there's a stereoelectronic component. And so if you know that there's a stereoelectronic component, that that can be exploited. And in a way that if it's just hydrophobic, you know, and, and I think if, if there were a lot of hydrophobic effects, then you wouldn't have these polarizable aromatics, you would just have hydrophobic groups there and you don't, you see a, you know, disincentive to have those. So, I mean, like, like making fluorinated oligosaccharides, like what you're doing, you're perturbing that, those stereoelectronics as well. And that could be really useful and interesting. Okay. Right. Uh, I think I saw uh, Stephen, please go ahead. Yes. Um, you were mentioning the, how they can, you know, some of these pathogens can decorate themselves with uh, uh, carbohydrates that look like ours. Can't some of the viruses actually hijack the machinery we use to, uh, uh, you know, like uh, SARS and uh, HIV actually take our own machinery and put our own uh, carbohydrates on there to, you know, that really hide the things from our immune system? So you're right. Um, they, they do do that, like, because they invade our cells and then they use our normal glycosylation. But there are viruses that come with their own glycosyl transferases and then they, they decorate themselves <laughs> with some of our stuff and some of their stuff. And um, it turns out that a lot of the viruses don't go through exactly the protein folding pathway. Like they put stress on the system and then they kind of butt off. And so that's why like HIV doesn't have all the modifications that we would have. It just starts with mannose and then it just buds off. And so you get like these high, these different non-human like sugars, even though they used our machinery, they, they just, they didn't go through our entire modification program. But our, um, uh, our system can't recognize those, those subtle differences. I don't know. So <laughs> I don't know. I, I think that it's so, so some of the surfactant I mean, proteins are likely to be important with COVID and it's just not fully studied, mm. but there are, there are, uh, you know, you, there's some data in the literature suggesting that they could contribute is what I should say. So depending on your lung, depending on what you encode, because there are variants of them amongst the human population, that mm -hmm. might also have an influence on disease progression, but that's total speculation, not connected. Some loose connections, I don't know how real they are. And, and the loose connections are more for SARS-CoV-1, so. I see, okay. It's possible. 
is all I'm saying. It's possible because we need to, you know, I've just focused also on bacteria, but, you know, HIV, some of these other proteins might look more like fungal pathogens. And so we may have a program to also recognize fungal pathogens or, um, so, so they also put weird sugars on them. Fungi are, look more like HIV, frankly. Mm -hmm. so maybe we have a defense against fungi that doesn't work on HIV. It's just not fully yeah. serving us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Rather important if you want your uh, immune system to know when to kick in. Yeah, well, the kind of cool thing about the modular structure of these immune proteins is you could think about mix and matching them with, carbohyd with carbohydrate binders that better do the job. Mm -hmm. In other words, like if I have the ability to recruit the immune system and I just, I just put a different recognition protein there, maybe I can, can you know, recruit the immune system to a different. Yeah, jazz it up. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Very important. I think there's other uh, things in the chat too. I don't know. Dorothy, I think you have a question, right? Elishi, there appears to be a question from Daron Friedberg in the chat. Oh. Yeah. Hi, Laura. That was a great talk. Um, hey, so good to hear from you. Yeah. Um, my question is back to the stereo electronics, of course. Uh, I guess I had two questions, but um, let me focus on what I put in the chat box. So. You know, carbohydrates, we all know, are really stereochemically complex. And you talk mainly about beta anomers. And so alpha and beta would have significantly different stereoelectronic effects, and, but they're subtle. So did you, A, look at those? And, did you, and how did you disentangle um, which stereoelectronic effects were contributing rather than just, okay, you had three CH pi interactions. I think that was really, that's a good point. But, you know, how do you tweak these to make a better ligand? How do you um, make it a worse ligand, for example? So um, the beta anomers uh, that I showed, right, e equatorial substitution, guys who aren't like carbohydrate nerds. Um, so if you have an axial substituent on that ring, you don't see the same preferences. Because also you're, you know, once you have an axial substituent, now the two position, depending on the stereochemistry, right, can also be polarized. And so you actually see less of a preference for aromatics to be on one side of the ring or the other. And- um, So is, is uh, axial hydroxyl repulsive or just not attractive? And the second follow-up is what about an N-acetyl group? Yeah, so- Okay, so one thing we, we, we found is we found no preference um, for N-acetyl glucosamine to gauge in CH pi interactions. And that was important because Jeff Kelly had done a lot of beautiful work to look at that interaction and he concluded, yeah, there's, no, there's only dispersive forces that contribute to that CH pi interaction. But what we found is it's really weak if it's even there. And so where you mostly see them is in beta glucose, beta mannose, I'm sorry, beta galactose, beta mannose, you know, mannose mean, you know, anything that has the, um, and the other ones, I'm not saying there's no contribution. I'm just saying it's worth less energetically. Right, right, understood. Yeah, thanks. And how would you perturb it? I, I think judicious substitution of floral groups could really right. perturb it. I, you know, like thinking about putting electron withdrawing groups at different positions, especially if you know an aromatic is there, you could really influence that binding. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah thank you. Rossi, I, I think you have a question, right? Yeah, I have two related questions. Okay. Uh, one is um, I, you, I noticed that these proteins are all oligomeric. So is the action there? Is the affinity actually much higher than what you measure, say, in your simple binding experiments, and that you have this avidity that is uh, related to the oligomeric structure? Yeah. So good point. It's definitely um, we do see if you bind to a surface, you see nanomolar binding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I mean, it's not, not an affinity, but it's a. Yeah, but still, yeah. Yeah. And a, 
a related question, I guess kind of related. You say that this kind of like a surveillance system where you have some uh, lectins that are going to basically be programmed to destroy, others to actually capture beneficial organisms. What's on the, what, do you have any idea of the sort of numbers when you're talking about this kind of army of, of, uh, of uh, surveillance, surveillance army? What's the estimated number of lectins that contribute to this? Um, okay, so I should be very clear. The whole recruitment thing is just completely my. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, I don't know. We, we're just, that's very yeah. hypothetical. Yeah. But I think it's reasonable. I think yeah, it makes so, sense. But we, but that's just not been looked at, and so there's just not a lot of information out there. But so I don't, I couldn't tell you like, but I can tell you there's, you know, we have like um, of soluble lectins, we have, I don't know, maybe seventy. But that's wow. just what's been identified, and so there are some things that we don't know for sure what they are and some things that might be misidentified. So that's kind of, and then that's the soluble one. So there's many, many more that are on yep. the cell surface. And, and those on the cell surface are probably also involved in surveillance because they're mostly on the immune cell surface. And so like dendritic cells or macrophages are I think also recognizing pathogens the thing is that the, the arrays that allow you to look for microbial glycan interactions kind of just came online in the last, you know, uh, four or five, five years, six years. So they just hadn't been out there. And so no, every, no one really has looked at this. And, and, it, and might they be localized? Because what you find when you actually look at, um, at the microbiome, is that they have certain niches even within the body that you're gonna, you know, say if you, for instance, the uh, the uh, colon is very different from the small intestine, et cetera. Yes, in the and there are, there are gradients. So, we, so I didn't have time to talk about this and a lot of it's unpublished, but we've gone through the single cell data. So we have some information about what cells are making different lectins and where they're making them. And yeah. so, you know, hopefully we'll be able to provide that soon. We need to, we're still in the process of analyzing the data, but the questions that you're asking are really germane. Like, are there some that are just dramatically upregulated in disease or downregulated? So there's all this data out there. We just need to look because most people don't care about this. <laughs> so my goal is to make people care about it because I think it's actually really important. Yeah, so do I. Thank you. All right. So uh, Laura, there's a question from the chat. Uh, is anything you're doing related to COVID-19? Yeah, so we have, um, we're working on a paper. I almost thought about talking about it, but it just didn't fit in with the rest of the story. But we are, um, so the thing about, um, so we did these experiments that where we are basically lectin fingerprinting COVID-19. So, um, so SARS-CoV-2, we're lectin fingerprinting it. So we have these lectins and we're looking at which lectins bind the virus. Um, and so we actually have a really uh, cool fingerprint of lectins so we can look at virus to understand um, whether or not it's glycosylated in, um, like whether or not if you produce it in cell line X, if it's gonna be similar to what you would get from a patient. And then the other thing that we're doing in that area is that we're um, testing whether or not we can use this lectin fingerprinting strategy to identify, um, to identify um, neutralizing antibodies. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so uh, I'm sure there, there are more questions, but because of the time, so we'll conclude the Mark lecture. And Laura, thank you so much again, you know, for giving a fantastic lecture. And thank you everyone for your participation.